We will move on then now. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Connie Lehman, again, friend and colleague at Mass General, who will talk to us about the future vision of personalized risk assessment and screening. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, uh, Terry. So I'm just delighted to be here and um, grateful for the opportunity to share the things that we've been doing. Um, you know, it's interesting when we think about the history. Uh, this was a advertisement by the American Cancer Society. And I often look at this advertisement and think how little has changed. You know, we're still um, discussing from the 1970s to 1995 to 2015 to today in 2023, what age should you start and how often should you be screened? And yet we know so much more about our patients than just their age, of, of course. But this ad was, if you're a woman over 35, be sure to schedule a mammogram. And so, um, next slide. So the progress over the past 50 years really focused on imaging technology and secondarily computer assistance in interpreting exams. But we're now poised to tackle challenges of which test and which patient at what time. And that's really what I'd like to focus on today. Now, what's our challenge? Why have we not already moved from age-based screening to risk-based screening? Why aren't we better at that? Honestly, today, um, we have a patient's age density to some extent in some centers is influencing screening recommendations, but a very, very, very low level. And I'll explain why that is in a, in a moment. We are able, and that was a beautiful talk on risk, to identify women who need more than just average risk screen, uh, screening with mammography starting at 40 every year or two. So um, we're, we're poised to really change this paradigm, but the key point we need are better risk models. In fact, the majority of women diagnosed with breast cancer have no known risk factors. The Katie Couric effect, genetic mutations are identified in less than 10% family history and less than 15% of all of the um, population of patients with breast cancer. Our traditional risk models as noted are, we, we weigh on them heavily now, but they have really modest accuracy and they have racial biases that I'll, I'll share with you. So age and breast density, let's, let's look at where we can go from here. Our work in artificial intelligence, leveraging more data than just density, out of the mammogram is what we're very excited about. So there's some areas where there's a lot of debate in medicine and there's others where there's absolute uniform agreement and everyone agrees we need better risk models. The very um, scientists who developed the, the most commonly used traditional clinical breast uh, risk models, uh, Mitch Gale with the Gale model or the NCI BCRAT model, um, we have um, the Tyre Cusick by Jack Cusick, the CRA, all of the people that developed this says we have to do better. These really aren't performing at the level that we need to make significant decisions. Now, of course, with this information in the hands of the B-Prep clinic staff and the experts there, you can be guided um, in an appropriate way, but we all agree we need better models. In fact, um, my friends in the Dutch Prisma studies were really excited to address risk-based screening um, in their very large screening studies. The Europeans do um, population screening at a level that we don't do in the US, and that affords them the opportunity to really study how best to screen. But they've concluded that they're, it's not ready for prime time, that they um, found that the preliminary results of the five-year risk discrimination with the tire Cusick or IBES, including the most modern version with breast density, the Bodice and the Gale, just weren't at a level of performance that could influence in a significant way, in a positive way, how they were going to screen women. And in fact, the next step where they tried to calibrate these models to be even more precise failed. Because I will be talking a little bit about AUCs or area under the curve, I just put a graphic here uh, to clarify what these are. The ROC curves give you a sense of not only the sensitivity of a test, how many cancers is it going to find of all the cancers in the population, but it also gives you a sense of the specificity. How often would my test tell a woman, you could have cancer or you're at high risk for cancer, 
And in fact, that woman never developed cancer, what we would call a false positive test. If our test was so bad that we might as well just flip a coin, our area under the curve or our AUC would be 50%. You flip a coin and get the answer, you're high or low risk. If it was a perfect test, the line would be up here in the far left corner, um, this pink line, and an AUC of 0.65 or 65% is really considered pretty modest. So we're looking for higher performance, certainly, than what we continue to see of 0 0.58, 0 0.61 um, AUCs of the traditional risk models. My colleague, Leslie Lamb, was particularly interested in studying the traditional risk models across races. Our colleague, Dave, David Jones, had shown that many of our clinical algorithms, whether it's looking for high-risk pregnancies or high-risk for renal failure or um, high-risk for breast cancer, many of these have these race corrections and racial biases that are really problematic. Leslie studied a very large population of women in the mass general um, system and found that 50% of the white patients attending mass general were told that they were at least at intermediate risk, above a five-year risk of 1.67%, but only 20% of our Hispanic patients. Leslie did the next step and said, well, is this actually reflecting the actual cancer burden across these populations? And it wasn't. There was equivalent uh, cancer burden in our white, Asian, Black, and Hispanic, but a very racially biased um, assessment of risk where more white women were sort of favored in engagement in high-risk programs. So what about density? Um, I like this matrix um, here. It's called a confusion matrix. And what it does is it takes all the patients we had in our study, and we knew from the mammogram alone, their AI or their artificial intelligence five-year breast cancer risk score. So from the mammogram, we can extract information that gives us a sense not only does this woman have cancer now, can I see a lesion on the mammogram, but what's the chances she'll develop cancer in the next five years? And so every patient that we had, we knew their density and we knew their AI risk score, and we put them into one of the four squares. But this really helps me when I'm thinking about how we can best use breast density. I think breast density is much more important in its risk of hiding breast cancers than in its predicting future breast cancer occurrence. So I think the breast density itself is a very weak risk factor. So in fact, we have patients in our system who have dense breast tissue, as shown in this lower left-hand corner, but are at low AI risk. They had no different five-year breast cancer occurrence compared to those that were not dense and had the low risk AI. It was really the AI risk score from the mammogram, which takes so much more than just density that helped us separate out those women that needed more attention. So this is a domain that we're so excited. And I, I'm guessing that some of the questions will be about when is this available? And uh, we just can't wait to have it more clinically available, even if within the Mass General Brigham systems in a clinical uh, research trial, but we're just not there now to do this prospectively, but we hope to be soon because we are at the brink. We have AI risk assessment models that can now empower women for personalized screening and risk reduction, supporting more effective early detection and cancer prevention. I'm so excited about the potential that a woman, every time she gets her mammogram, isn't just being told everything looks fine, we'll see you next year, or we see something, we need to work it up. But also, this is the risk that we're deriving from your mammogram. Let's use this with the other data points we have to have a more personalized approach for you and your screening. So let me tell you a little bit about the AI work. Um, certainly AI is everywhere. We don't know to be excited or to fear it. It's um, it had such um, interesting um, impacts on various domains. What really excited us in healthcare was in June, 2012, when a Google Brain computer cluster trained itself to recognize a cat from millions of images in YouTube videos. Now, whether you're a cat or a dog lover, you might wonder why this was important. It's because it exploded the field of computer vision. And in healthcare, we rely on images so much, but we rely on our human eyes and our human brains to interpret those images. So now we're seeing AI and deep learning computer models that are 
with computer vision assessing pathology slides, skin lesions, images of the back of the retina, and yes, mammograms. And the deep learning sort of because we have such fast computers is able to take millions of images that are labeled as a cat or a dog and learn over time again and again and again, relearning, relearning until it can be extremely precise at identifying an image as being of a cat or a dog. So now translate the exactly the same software programs in the computer vision domain and say, well, what if I gave it images of breast mammograms? And then I labeled every mammogram as either this was in a woman who developed cancer in five years, and that mammogram was in a woman who didn't develop breast cancer in five years. So you can imagine why we call it a revolution, an explosion, because we have limitless images in medical healthcare, and we have so many different questions we want to ask. Will this woman recur? Is this a cancer that will more likely fail traditional treatment methods? So we're just at the beginning of this. Regina Barsley at MIT and her lab um, and I partnered together to develop a Mirai model. Um, this is a risk model that is based on the mammograms alone. We developed the model using a very large collection of mass general uh, mammograms with known outcomes. And then we wanted to see how it would perform outside of Boston, outside of mass generals. So we tested this around the world and we were delighted to see very, very consistent performance with our AUCs with this model hovering in the 0 0.7, 0 0.71 domain, a big leap forward from the old school traditional risk models of 0 0.61. Now I'm going to shift to how did we then start to test this on its ability to change the way we screen. We all remember when we were uh, impacted by the shutdown with COVID, um, our governor asked us that we stop um, many what were referred to as unnecessary um, interventions as we so desperately needed more attention and more resources um, in the COVID um, time. So screening mammography was put on hold and when it reopened, we were asked to bring the patients in first that were at highest risk. Well, given our traditional risk models favored white women and had really modest predictive accuracy, we were concerned about that. We did rapidly, once we reopened, um, start to bring more women in for screening. And then we found we actually weren't supporting equitable recovery. The women coming back for screening when we reopened were higher SE Yes, much more likely to be white than identifying as um, Asian, Hispanic, or, or Black. So we thought, what if we were in this new paradigm? What if already we were using our deep learning risk model instead of our traditional breast cancer risk models to support risk-based mammography screening? And we found that impact would have been significant. If we had brought in our patients who were uh, deep learning five-year risk scores above 2%, the cancer detection per thousand screen would have been right at eight cancers per thousand, and those under 2% were at 1.3 cancers per thousand. 1.3 cancers per thousand is a level of cancer burden that we don't even currently now recommend screening at all. This would be average risk women in their 20s and 30s. So this really had a start to think about it. But even more importantly in that same study, um, Terry was part of this and our full um, fantastic group of collaborators across our centers, we found that we didn't have that racial bias with our deep learning model that we had with the Tyre Cusick and the NCI Gale model. So significant differences in women who identified as other than white who were invited into screen if we were using Tyre Cusick or NCI. Only 30% um, and 27% um, were invited to screen and th those invitations were shifted more to white women, but not so with our deep learning model. And this also had an impact on the cancers detected. If we had been using this, we would have found significantly more cancers in women identifying as white compared to the cancers um, in women identifying as Asian, Hispanic, or African-American. So Leslie Lamb also was curious, given that we had noticed we are screening many more women um, who are white in our MRI screening program than we are um, in in our even as we step up from screening mammography, which tends to even there favor white women, it really took a leap to favor white women once we went to MRI. 
So she thought, what if we did the same thing? What if we focused on our deep learning model? Um, patients identified as high risk by our deep learning model had significantly higher cancer burden risk. So they were almost 21 cancers per thousand screened with MRI compared to very low, low levels of cancer burden in our screening MRI program based on the tire acoustic and the NCI models. So this is another application that we're eager to explore. One of the reasons why we think this is so important is we know MRI has many challenges. Certainly the cost, the access, the patient experience of getting in the MRI, but also we've studied this carefully with the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium and others, and a minority of women who meet the guidelines for high-risk screening are actually undergoing MRI. So we have challenges there, and we think we may have opportunities to bring the right women in at the right time for the right test. So now I'm gonna shift. We're going to talk a little bit about um, rethinking our screening uh, strategies with increased risk strategies. And I want to touch base on ultrasound, contrast enhanced mammography and MRI. And I'm gonna really focus on fast MRI because um, honestly today, no one should be having a breast MRI where they're in the scanner for more than 20 minutes, um, unless there's some issue or problem. We have methods to do MRI much more efficiently than we did in the past. Vascular imaging has incredible power, whether it's breast MRI with gadolinium or contrast enhanced mammography with an iodinated contrast. These vascular enhanced screening tools will find cancers that we just can't see with regular mammography and with ultrasound. That data is so clear. I don't know if uh, you're a member in your screening program is part of uh, Brigham or MGH, but compared to some centers across the country, we don't tend to do very much screening ultrasound. And the reason why is we're really looking at the science. This has been shown again and again and again. Ultrasound screening will give you a slight bump up from mammography screening. So this was a study by Christian Kuhl uh, in her practice just over five cancers per thousand by mammography. If she added ultrasound to that, it would bump up um, and add about an, a two to three more cancers per thousand. That is such a consistent story. So it's not that you don't five added, added cancers, it's just that bump up is very small and the price to pay are the false positives along with the ultrasound. But the bigger price to pay in my mind is the missed cancers because women are being screened with ultrasound rather than vascular enhanced imaging. Because once you add MRI in, you leap up, you almost double uh, the amount of cancers that you are uh, identifying with mammography and ultrasound. And in fact, we've all found, and this has been in European studies and US studies, that it's really the combination of MR and mammography, which provides the strongest screen strategy for women um, at increased risk. And just a shout out that we really have done a lot of work in our technology to bring the scan time down. There still can be some time to get patients set up, to get them in the scanner, to get them positioned, but the actual time of that obnoxious knocking and being inside the scanner while the images are being obtained should definitely be under uh, 10 minutes. And that's universally across the country that people have shifted to FAST or some refer to it as abbreviated MRI protocols. But this is what I'm excited about. Modern contrast enhanced mammography absolutely can replace breast MRI based on its performance and the strong potential for increased access and decreased cost. If you were to get a contrast enhanced mammogram, it would be very similar to just getting your regular mammogram, except you would have an IV place first. The nurse or the assistant would then inject an iodinated contrast, like gadolinium with MRI, but this is the kind of contrast we can see with x-ray. We'd wait two minutes, and then you'd have what would feel very much like just a regular old mammogram. But then what we have, because you have the contrast in your breast tissue, is we have the ability to create different kinds of images. This image on the left is what will obtained by that sweep that we, we do of the regular mammogram. That's just a regular mammogram. And then we're going to subtract out the mammogram that was tuned. It's the same mammogram, but we're going to filter it so we can see where the contrast is. And we subtract those two on the far right. You can see this small cancer hidden on our regular mammogram 
but really just pops out on the contrast enhanced mammography. This is very similar to a contrast enhanced MRI, but it's much faster. And for um, many studies that have been done, women prefer this over MRI. But again, there'd be uh, two minutes waiting while the contrast circulates. And then um, these pairs are, are taken um, two minutes later. So you have your four views of your screening mammogram and you're done. And that usually takes about eight minutes. Some people are obviously and should be concerned and wanna make sure that this isn't providing um, unnecessary added radiation. It's a very small increase when you get a CEM in radiation versus a regular mammogram. With GE, it's about 20% more. With Hologic, it's about 40% more. But I can't stress enough that all of these domains of added um, radiation are well, well beneath thresholds that we look for for um, safe um, screening tests. So whether um, it's GE or Hologic or Siemens, whether we're talking about 2D or Toma Synthesis 3D or contrast enhanced mammography, these are very low levels of radiation. So why aren't we using CEM routinely in our clinical practices? And why isn't everyone getting a Mirai AI risk score? Um, let's first talk about CEM. It's been around for over two decades. My colleague, John Lewin, published on this that I really think this should change the field of breast imaging. Um, it didn't, but thankfully now we have uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Maxine Jockelson, and right here in Boston, Jordana Phillips, they have been those early adopters, strong, strong advocates for CEM and doing the hard work to study it, to test it, to um, give conferences on it, to also um, develop all of the technology in the, in the background, how radiologists are gonna start use this, how can we bring it into our practices? And I'm delighted that um, at this time, both Brigham and Mass General are offering CEM and we also have CEM biopsy at Mass General. So we have a consortium where we can support our patients to start bringing this technology out to more, more people. Now, I wanna point out that most of the studies on CEM were European studies. Um, they again, have very large programs um, that, are, um, that lend themselves well to cl large clinical research trials. While there's some heterogeneity in the uh, European practices, and how they tested CEM, we have a uh, consistency. This is, an, this is another area under the curve. It's another ROC curve. We have a very high, high curve um, with CEM, sensitivity of 95% in, in line with MRI and a specificity of 81%. So we're very, very excited about this. Bottom line with CEM, you've got your regular low energy images that are shown on the left. That's your regular mammogram. And then these contrast enhanced mammography images. I love reading these. I don't think they're going to have anywhere near the false positives of MRI. And many studies are starting to show that, that we think, especially in the right hands or the right training, it's just going to be a much cleaner exam um, and easier for radiologists to separate out the really normal cases and not have as many callbacks or unnecessary biopsies or short interval follow-ups. Um, the sensitivity, the ability to find cancers, appears to be very similar. Um, and we have studies where CEM is really preferred by the majority of patients, particularly those that they know their breast imaging center, they're familiar with the mammogram, and it becomes more challenging, especially in our rural areas, to have access to breast MRI. Um, and fewer biopsies are needed, and when it is needed, CEM biopsy is faster and more comfortable than MRI biopsy. So now I'm just gonna finish. Um, we've come a long way from this poor woman in the upper left-hand corner that had this very patronizing advertisement telling her that if she hadn't had a mammogram, she needed more than her breasts examined. I think what she was really thinking is I'd like to be given more than just the option of a mammogram at that time at 35, over the decades at 50, at 40, and, and really just having a very blunt, blunt instrument for um, a incredible diversity of women at risk for breast cancer. So now with the tools that we have and the technology we have, I think we're moving into informed decision-making, empowerment of women for personalized screening and risk reduction, and um, couldn't be more excited to be part of this team that is moving this field forward um, and helping us transition from age-based to more precise risk-based screening with the right technology um, and affordable care. So thanks so much and thank you 
Terry, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Connie, for um, a, a great talk. Lots of exciting uh, technology on the horizon. And, and we know all of us in the BPREP program and, and our, our patients, and I'm sure many people on the uh, forum this morning are excited to see some of this technology get into the clinics and excited to see more widespread availability of contrast enhanced uh, mammography. I just, I, I need to be very clear right now though, for everyone, we we do have contrast enhanced mammography at both Mass General and the Brigham system, but it is not widely available right now. The teams are still working out the appropriate um, workflows, the appropriate uh, you know patient selection criteria to, um, to really um, make the most of this resource. It, it is, um, it is a different type of mammogram, as, as Connie pointed out. It takes a little bit longer, um, but there's just a lot of different um, pieces that have to be put into place to make sure that our screening centers can offer this, again, safely and to the appropriate patient. So um, uh, please, 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 uh, if you call and ask for a contrast enhanced uh, mammogram, please understand that right now, again, we're just getting started and uh, we do not have as much availability as we hope to have in the future. Uh, but it is certainly something that we are all very excited about and would like to uh, explore further. Um, with that said, um, kind of maybe I'll just have you come back to a couple of the, the basics. So you mentioned that regular mammograms um, are safe. The amount of radiation that we get from a regular mammogram that does not increase one's risk of breast cancer. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, Again, should women be looking for 3D mammograms? Can they still have 2D mammograms? And how many images should women be expected to have when they go in for a mammogram? I think in, the, in our domain of, of um, mammography, tomosynthesis or 3D mammography really has replaced 2D. So I think if you're going to get a mammogram, um, it's a good idea to get the 3D. We are having a very rapid shifting away from 2D plus the tomosynthesis sweep, there's a way to take that tomosynthesis sweep and create a synthetic 2D mammogram. So actually the radiation is the same. There isn't more radiation by getting a 3D versus a 2D. And it's only because there were still centers doing both the 2D and the 3D that there was any added radiation, but all well below the threshold. But I do think if you're getting a high quality mammogram by definition currently, and it's the fastest growing um, domain in the U.S. now mammography, you should get a tomosynthesis or 3D mammogram. As far as views, it really depends on your breast size. For the vast majority of women, four views are sufficient. Um, a single view in two views of the right breast, two views in the left breast, and you're done. However, there are some women that have extremely dense breasts, and their uh, technologists will view that and then do an angled view where they get more of the lateral dense breast tissue and then finally, we have women with large breasts where the regular screens that we have aren't just aren't going to cover the full breast. So then we need to do something called tiling, and that might be some additional views. So hopefully for the vast majority of women, it's four views and they're done, but there can be women. And it, certainly if you're concerned about the number of views being taken, you should always feel free to speak up and ask. Um, and if that changes over time, what, why that is. Great. Thank you. And again, coming back to MRI, we know that MRI is, again, a very sensitive test, as you showed, uh, the combination of MRI plus mammogram certainly picks up more cancers in women at elevated risk. And so we certainly wanna make sure that we are sending the appropriate women for MRI imaging. Um, it does also you know, have a possibility of, of false positives, as you mentioned, so we don't want to subject everyone to enhance screening. We really want to identify the women who we think are going to benefit the most from that enhanced screening. And so can you talk a little bit about, um, there's a question about gadolinium, uh, the contrast that's used for MRI. Um, should we be, con they want to know, should they be concerned about any potential accumulation of gadolinium in the brain? So the this has been um, studied at, as, as much as can be studied, but I have to tell you that this is definitely a domain where the final ruling really isn't out. So gadolinium can um, and does, we do see deposits of that in the brain. We don't know the significance of that. To date, all of the people that are studying this feel that it is still not a significant concern, but I know from the way the studies are done, 
there are many areas in healthcare where it's much later that we actually understand um, the full spectrum. We have a lot more history and experience with iodinated contrast that does not have this issue. So it's another plus check mark for CEM over MRI. And the one area I wanna make sure that um, women do here is that gadolinium is contraindicated during pregnancy. So there's a lot that we'll say to reassure patients, um, but uh, gadolinium isn't something that we would recommend during pregnancies. So for our high-risk patients who are pregnant, we don't see a reason to stop mammography during the pregnancy, but we do not recommend um, gadolinium contrast enhanced MRI during pregnancy. Thank you. And maybe just uh, and one more minute before our we go to our break, um, but very exciting um, changes to screening recommendations um, this year with the age uh, age to start screening, uh, coming back down to a, a younger age, it certainly made all of us who take care of, of younger women and women at high risk, uh, happy to see that. Do you wanna just share a little bit for the group again, uh, what the recommendations are and why it's important to um, get in for your first mammogram? We can't stress enough how excited we are that finally um, we can move away from the confusion where the United States Preventative Services Task Force, that mouthful USPSTF, where they said, you know what, women should start screening at 40, we are going to recommend that. That has been a long time coming. Now we have universal agreement between the American College of Radiology, the Society of Breast Imaging, the USPSTF, all women age 40 and older should start screening mammography. They still are saying every two years, we're saying every one year. I think if you're young and you're being screened, we know your cancers will grow more quickly. I think annual screening mammography starting at 40 is, um, is really the message we wanna get out. And unfortunately, as is understandable, how to screen for breast cancer with mammography is one of the domains of the highest level of confusion where women are just saying, I, I've just heard so much, I don't even know what I should do anymore. But it's make sure if you're 40 or older, you should be getting regular mammography, and we really want you to start at 40. And if you have risk factors, family history, other things that have been discussed, really talk to your doctor because then we have other recommendations for those patients who are truly at high risk. Yeah, absolutely, so thank you. So on that note, um, we are gonna take a short break uh, and we'll come back uh, for our last, um, our last three speakers. Uh, we will come back at 1045, so everybody please, uh, uh, enjoy the quick break and we will see you at 1045. Thank you.